is 1 through 11. Please open your Bibles. Now I'll read. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went out and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into a blood of that like a dead person, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these judgments, O Holy One. You who are and who were. For they shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel pulled out his bull on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues but they refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bull on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. Please allow me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up your precious name. This week, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather before you and to be able to sing songs of praise to you and to worship you. Right now, COVID-19 is going around as well as the very hot heat in the summer. And it seems like there's a lot of things infringing on our lives at this time. However, Lord, we know that we can always look up to you and we're always connected to you. We remember, Lord, that you give us a lot of grace. And Lord, allow us to be continue to be protected and guided by you. Please watch over Pastor Anjiki as he gives the message this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you will speak to us and we look forward to what you have to say to us. Allow us, Lord, to be able to sufficiently understand what you have to say to us and be able to apply it in our daily lives. We have great expectations with praying with gratitude in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be able to worship with all of you again today. Just about every day, you can see information on the TV, and there's a lot of information about the the United Church that's going around. Right now, there's a, ch- a change in the name, actually, to the United uh, Church, and 
because of the incident of the former prime minister being assassinated, this United Church um, has gained a spotlight. And so that's a big item in the news right now. There are some people who hear this information and they possibly could think in the following way. What I mean is that they're like, oh, religion is really scary. And I have no interest in being part of any religion in my life. There's likely people who have this opinion now because of what happened. A few years ago, there was the Alm cult, and they had the incident of the saline uh, gas in the subway. And at that time, a lot of people really thought poorly of religion and they were like I'm having nothing to do with this in my life and I, I heard a lot of opinions about that at that time and this time now with this incident and it's likely that's the same however that's not the correct stance to have for example right now it's summer right and so there's people who get food poisoning due to the heat <laughs> but people don't say oh food is scary I shouldn't eat anymore I don't want to have anything to do with food anymore so it's crazy thinking, right? Food is something that we need and it supports our life as it gives us health. Good food is good for your health. In the same way, good faith is appropriate and good for our souls. Of course, rotten religion is not. However, correct faith is what can allow our hearts or our souls to be healthy. We have to know where we came from. What is the purpose of our life? And we have to know what happens after we die. We can have hope because of this if we know the correct information. And that can allow our souls to be healthy. However, when we hear all this wrong information, and if people believe all this wrong information, then a certain kind of social uh, phenomenon can occur. For example, you may remember about the prophecy of Nostradamus. This was actually a, a prophet in the 16th century, and he actually predicted a lot of things that did come to pass. And according to the prophecy of Nostradamus, in 1973 in July, the world was supposed to end, and that was supposed to be the end of things. And, and there was a book that was written about this, and many people actually believed it. So in 1973, when this book was published, the following year, a movie was made with the same title. And the movie was actually recommended by the Ministry of Education. Can you believe that? The Japanese government was actually encouraging students and people to watch this film. However, what did that prof prophecy happen? What happened? It was not true. It didn't come to pass. However, when a number of people believe in something, then this, there's a social phenomenon that occurs. They believe it. And there was also an instance about the May Mayan calendar back in 2012. And based on the Mayan calendar calculation, it was predicted that in December 23rd on 2012, uh, or that would be the end of the world. That was supposed to be the end of humanity. And so after that, nothing was really needed. So that was the prophecy that went around then. And bo many people actually believed in this. Of course, that was not the case either. Hmm. It's likely that similar things are going to uh, be predicted for the future as well. And every single time, there's going to be people who get all worried about it and anxious about it, and they actually even change their lifestyles based on these lies. However, we need to be careful about this fake news and not believe it. There's one thing that we can do to uh, be not be confused about it, and that's to know the true news. And the true news is only available in one location in the Bible. The Bible is a book of prophecy. It's not just a book of religion. It speaks about God and tells exactly what he has planned. 
There's a lot of prophecies in the Bible that have already come to pass, so we can look back over history and see that they have come to pass as predicted in the Bible. And we can actually compare it to our history. And it's amazing because there is not a single prophecy that has not come to pass. The prophecies of, Bi of the Bible, if you really look into them, you can see that they all come to pass exactly as predicted. You can see that if everything has come to pass so far, you can be confident that everything else that is predicted that will happen will happen as predicted. And the book of Revelation is actually a book that explains a lot of things that are still yet to come. Uh, from chapters 4 and thereafter, it speaks specifically about that. We've already looked at uh, quite a bit of Revelation. We're up to chapter 16 today. So let me just uh, review a little bit of Revelation for you. At the end of the history of humanity, there's going to be a period of time known as the Great Tribulation, which is a period of seven years, and it's a time of God's wrath. During this period of seven years, the second coming of Jesus will end that. And then, uh, so this second, seventh year period of the Great Tribulation is split into the first three and a half years and second three and a half years. And God's wrath will take place during this time in three different manners. There's going to be seven, we've already read about the seven seals and then the seven trumpets. We've already learned about that as well. The third one is about seven bowls, and that's what we're going to learn about today. However, how this is all written is written how this, the first seal is opened and all these colorful horses come on the scene and there's war and uh, plagues and uh, different things that come to pass because of that. We go up to the sixth seal and when the seventh seal is opened, then seven trumpets uh, begin and the seventh trumpet judgment is part of the seven seals. As the angels blow the trumpets, then different uh, things happen on the earth. When the seventh trumpet is about to be blown, then an angel with the seven bulls comes to the scene. And that's what we're learning about today. It's inside the seventh trumpet. And that's also, therefore, inside the seventh seal. So you have to really understand the structure of Revelation as you're going through the book. The second three and a half years are when this uh, seven bowls of judgment will take place. We're going to look specifically at today at the first through the fifth bowls of wrath. Looking at verse 1, it says, Then I heard, and this I it's referring to here is John. John had faith and but was actually still uh, on the island and he was able to see an image a vision of Jesus Christ and this is what he wrote about so that's what's all written here in the book of Revelation so it's then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels so this loud voice here is referring to God's voice God's voice himself and loud indicates that it's very important it's very urgent and that's why it's loud here. What did he say? Well, he said to the seven angels, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. So the seven angels were there and each of them had this had a bowl. And inside the bowl had God's wrath. And they were throwing or pouring out this wrath onto the earth as in instructed. So the judgment or the wrath of the seven bulls is what happens in the second three and a half year period of the Great Tribulation. And it's all just part of this um, continuation of wrath, but it's actually at the very end, the very, very end and very concentrated um, uh, administration of it. So if the if this wrath was like taken place slowly over time, the earth would not be able to withstand it. That's why likely it just happens all at once. The first bowl of wrath is mentioned in verse two. It says that ugly festering sores broke out on people. 
So on human skin, is, uh, these festering sores break out. And whose skin is it that it occurs on? Well, it's not on everyone. It, if you look at verse 2, it says that it broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worship its image. So here, it, this beast it's referring to is the Antichrist. And, and the word Antichrist actually doesn't, isn't mentioned in Revelation, but it's mentioned in uh, the book of uh, the John wrote. It mentioned, and it's this di di um, dictator who proclaims himself to be, the, to be God or the Antichrist. So Antichrist just means in place of Christ. So that's who comes to this uh, scene. And it's refer he's referred to as the beast. And the beast is, uh, is, is actually, a, be a beast is usually an animal. This is indicating that this person is just not even worthy of being a human. The Antichrist, uh, it says they had the mark of the beast. And so the Antichrist proclaims himself as God or as uh, an and people who worship him take this image, and that's the number of 666. In Hebrew, or in Greek, or in Latin, it has an, not only uh, the alphabet, but each alphabet letter can be uh, replaced with a specific number. And so, likely this uh, spelling is going to be able to be changed or converted into the number 666. And it's not that people are forcefully required to take this image or this, this, um, mark, but rather people are uh, happily willing to take it instead. And as uh, so as these people have taken the, the mark, then they are ones who worship the beast and then therefore are targets of God's wrath. In this era, there's only two types of people, those who worship the Antichrist and those who don't. So those are the Christians, right? There's nobody in between. It's one or the other. So most of the people you can see are not worshiping God. And, but the Christians are, do not be targets of this wrath. If you refer to chapter 14, there is prophecy in verse nine, starting in verse 9. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. In other words, anyone who receives a mark of the beast and worships him will be targets of God's wrath. And this is the prophecy of it. And this has come to place here, you can see in chapter 16. So the first one was these festering sores. The second bowl of wrath is mentioned in verse 3. It says, The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead person, and every living thing in the sea died. So here, it's not wrath against humans, but actually against the na natural realm. And actually, there's a mention of the um, this in the the judgment of the trumpets where already a third of the sea is turned into blood and a third of the living creatures have the sea died and this was the second trumpet's wrath so in this passage the remaining two thirds are destroyed and then you can imagine if there is a uh, if there's news as there's been news in the past where all of a sudden for some reason like a large number of fish die in the ocean or a river or something And if you think about that, you know, in the past, it's just been one area around the world. But here in the Great Tribulation, this is going to be something that happens worldwide. And it's not just going to be fish. It's going to be um, sharks and whales and all kinds of dolphins, all kinds of other animals. It's going to be really nasty. 
it's going to be really nasty smell too. You can imagine. You would think you would realize that this smell would likely go in several kilometers onto the land. There are some people who may say, "Oh, I'm going to be on. I'm going to be living on the mountains. I'll be fine." But I think no matter where you live, you're going to be impacted by this. Around the world as a whole, seventy percent of it is covered by sea or water, and thirty percent is land. And so this is actually supposed to be the ideal balance of land to sea or water ratio. We breathe in. Uh, we intake ox uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, sorry, we intake oxygen and put an uh, output carbon dioxide. However, it's the opposite for plants. For that's why we can get along well with the vegetation around the world. And you can realize that when this balance is offset, that you start uh, not feeling well. Right now. There's about 21 percent、uh, oxygen concentration in the atmosphere right now, and oxygen,、uh, sorry, the、um, carbon dioxide is、um, about、uh, taking in about half of this on the land vegetation, and and then it ends up being 21 percent. So to have half a、uh, half of the、um, Water animals die means that our oxygen concentration is going to cut be cut in half, and if that happens, that's going to be very difficult to breathe, almost like being on a high mountain. If there's only ten percent、um, oxygen, it's going to be very difficult to breathe. You may become unconscious, or you may feel sick or dizzy or have nausea. There'd be a lot of people who would die because of this as well. So. It doesn't matter if you live on the mountains or not, because the concentration of the oxygen would be the same. So, people who live not only near the ocean but also near the、uh, mountains would face the same fate. It would be just an environment that is not suitable for humans to live. The third bowl of wrath is mentioned in verse four. It says the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. In chapter eight in Revelation, it refers to the third trumpet being blown, and how a third of the sea has already turned to blood, and and living creatures in sea died. So, ah,、uh, sorry, a third of the water sources became contaminated, and now all of them are becoming contaminated. Ninety-seven percent of the water on the earth is salt water. You can't drink it. There's only three percent fresh water, and drinking water is about zero point one percent. And when that disappears, the only water there is to drink is that that is、uh, already prepared in PET bottles or、uh, things, because everything all the other water is going to be contaminated. And of course, that would mean that there's a limited limit to the number of no, amount of drinkable water. For humans, if they don't have food, they can still live for a week or two. But without water, it's almost impossible to live for a week. So, it's not circumstance. These are not circumstances in which humans can go on, and that's how we can see how the second coming of Christ would be very soon. When this ju judgment comes to pay at pass, there would be two people that would call call out to God. And one of them is where the people who say you are just in these judgments, O Holy One, you are who you were, are and who you were. So the angel rec recognizes that God is just who He is, who He says He is. And then also in verse seven, it says. And I heard from the altar respond, "Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments." So. The altar is responding, and this is actually—it's not the altar that's crying out here, but it's the people who are martyred in the great tribulation that are calling out. 
just right before the Great, great Tribulation be, um, begins, all of the Christians who are alive at that time will be raptured, so they will not be part of the Great Tribulation. You don't need to worry about that. And in chapter 4, it explains how uh, God has prepared a place for all of who, who believe in him. The people who are left behind after the rapture are ones who, some of them, which will become Christians, but most of those who become Christians will be martyred for their faith. And who is it that kills them? Well, it's people who believe in the Antichrist. They kill off the Christians. The people who are killed are wondering why other people don't believe in God and and they want to have judgment upon the people who are killing them. And that's why they call out to God, uh, demanding that he take judgment on them. And here, that does come to pass. In other words, those who are martyred are finally facing the judgment that God will bestow upon them. And that's because God is true in his judgment, in verse 7. This altar that's mentioned here is the altar where animals would be sacrificed. And it's just kind of like a big barbecue pit, or not pit, like grill or something. And all of the blood of the animals would come down through it. And that's just kind of like how these Christians martyred and all of their blood is coming down below the altar. Those who are martyred are the ones who are therefore calling out here in verse 7. And just like in a response to that, the people uh, who um, killed them are going to have to face um, judgment, as mentioned, as God is true in his judgment. Because water is turned into blood, those who have killed Christians would see, you would you would realize that they are face they would realize they are facing the judgment of the killing Christians. The fourth bowl of wrath is actually a wrath about the, uh, the sun. It says the fourth angel pulled out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given um, allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared with intense heat, so without water to drink, and then intense heat from the sun, it would just be a terrible situation. However, being hit by the sun is uh, only those who are following the Antichrist. It's not the Christians. How can I say that? Well, it says they were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God. And in the native and the original uh, word in Greek, it indicates. Uh, the English translation of the people indicating specific people only are being uh, affected by this intense heat from the sun. In other words, those who are following the Antichrist. The Christians are thus protected from this tragedy. And verse 9, it says, that once again, they were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. So specifically, the heat from the sun, what would that be? Well, it doesn't exactly explain, but some people have interpreted this to mean that it's just like what happens when the use of nuclear weapons takes place. And a nuclear weapon, when it explodes, has nitrogen oxide into this, puts nitrogen oxide into the stratosphere. And because of that, the ozone layer would be completely destroyed. If the ozone layer is destroyed, then all the hard, harmful ultraviolet rays would come directly upon to the Earth. And that's why a lot of people would come to have severe skin diseases and it would destroy the cells of living organisms as well as give cancer. However, I'm kind of uh, uncertain about believing this because it specifically says that the intense of heat will sear the people, not intense heat like that of the sun. When God 
um, wants to portray his wrath on people, he doesn't need to use something made by humans, such as nuclear weapons. When humans want to do harm to others, they use something that they made themselves. However, God made the sun. He's the creator God. And so he can just use what he has made, and that's why he can use the sun directly here. If you can imagine this, the sun would be very intense with heat. In Sano Tochigi Prefecture, recently it got up to 39.7 degrees, almost 40. And in Europe, it was actually over 40 degrees, 45, I think. And if it gets up to 50 degrees or 60 degrees, can you imagine what it would be like? It would just be severe heat. And the intense um, heat of the sun would not be... To, um, Would, would come directly because the ozone layer would not um, the ozone layer would not be in place. However, this is not just some natural disaster because there are people who would be safe from it. The fifth bull is mentioned in verse 10. The fifth angel pulled out his bull on the throne of the beast and its kingdom and was plunged into darkness. So this is darkness is the fifth bull of wrath. And where does it come out, come on to? It comes uh, out onto uh, the beast. The center of the time of the Great Tribulation is something we've already talked about. It's in Babylon. Babylon is the center of the world at that time. And right now, Babylon already exists. It's actually in Iraq. And the capital of Iraq is Baghdad, right? But And Baghdad is a huge city. And just about 90 kilometers south of that is the, the town of Babylon from the first century. And there's only a couple thousand people that live there now. However, that was where the place, the place where the Tower of Babel existed. And you may remember the dictator Saddam Hussein in Iraq many years ago. And he actually had a plan to restore uh, Babylon. However, that plan didn't come to play. Pay, come to um, place because of him. He was just, he was taken out. However, in the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist will restore Babylon. Babylon will be a place filled with idols, and it's always been that way since ancient times. And it's going to be covered in darkness, not just the, in, not, not the whole world, but specifically Babylon here. And this darkness and judgment is something that actually humanity has already experienced. And that was in the ancient Egypt, in the t days of Moses. There were ten um, plagues that took place, and one of those was darkness. When in Exodus 10, 22 through 23, it says, So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and the total darkness covered all the Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for about three days. Yet all of the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. So it was a period of three complete days where there is a darkness all over Egypt, very dark. You couldn't see people who were even who were standing right in front of your face. We, we normally wouldn't be able to experience this kind of darkness because at night we can see stars and we could see each other's faces with other lights. However, this is like pure darkness. However, even at this time, the people of Israelites um, in the city of Goshen near the Nile River You may, uh, this place will have a spotlight on there, and they were they are protected. However, all around Egypt, uh, um, it was filled with God's judgment. So, and this also happened one more time when Jesus was on the cross, and from a period of three hours from 12 to three, it was uh, very dark. That was when Jesus was on the cross. So darkness is associated thus with God's judgment. And the fifth bowl of wrath is exactly that. Where uh, the judgment is specifically targeted at Babylon. 
And at that time, the people from Israel have a, a rock or pot a place where they are protected, it says. One interesting aspect about this is actually mentioned in verse 11. It says, even though they're, they're experiencing all of this pain, they got uh, this skin disease, they have no access to clean water, and the sun's scorching heat is upon them, and now it's darkness. Even despite all of this judgment from God, in verse 11, it says, that they cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. Can you imagine this? If, you, if, for example, you were in the Great Tribulation and you were experiencing all this judgment, and you would see people in the same uh, circumstances not experiencing any of this, you would wonder, why are they not um, experiencing this? And you would know that they're Christians, and you would wouldn't you wonder why the Christians aren't experiencing this? Wouldn't you realize that they were not experiencing judgment because the God that they believed in is the ones, is the one who is the, creating all of it? However, these people don't come to that conclusion. The people in this era have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ a number of times, and we've already learned who's teaching, telling them the gospel. Uh, one of these groups of people is the 144,000 uh, people who are Jews who are come to faith in Christ after going into the Great Tribulation. They are supposed to go around the world to share the gospel. So for a period of seven years, they do, and not a single one of them is martyred because they are specifically protected by God. So they complete their calling, and they are able to go into the thousand-year reign. So they are telling the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're proclaiming him as the Savior. However, the people living in this uh, era, some of them don't decide to believe it. And, but, and I also mentioned before that there will be one angel in midair who proclaims the gospel as well. And John 14 mentions that telling um, people to repent and to f follow the true God. So that's what uh, the, the, the angel in heaven is saying, or in the midair, sorry. So they have heard the proclamation of Jesus Christ and what the, the, the angel is also created being by God but he's proclaiming this truth to the people. He's, he's telling, the angel's telling the people to worship this creator, God, and that's what he's crying out in midair. And in the people who became Christians in the um, Great Tribulation, of course, would be ones who would be proclaiming the gospel as well to others. Of course, all people would have the opportunity to hear the gospel here. However, people who have already given their hearts to the Antichrist would, would not be willing to give up their allegiance to him. For this reason, even though they're amidst this harsh judgment, they make no, make no effort to repent. And that you can see how this truly shows the human heart. When the time of wrath took place in Egypt and the plagues took place, you may remember the Pharaoh and how even though he saw all of these plagues, he didn't truly repent. Instead, even though he experienced all of these um, plagues, his heart, his heart just got even harder. Humans... Every time they um, deny God's salvation and deny the gospel, it just makes their heart even harder, and it makes it even more difficult for them to hear God's word. There are some people who say, yeah, I'll believe in Jesus Christ someday. However, they may not have this other day to believe in him. 
the people may say, oh, I'll believe in him before I die, but you don't know when you're going to die. And you don't know whether your heart is still going to be soft at the time when you would want to be making that decision. So every time someone denies Christ, their heart just gets harder. And for those who gave their hearts to the Antichrist, it's almost impossible for them to think otherwise. That's why here, when they are experiencing all this wrath of God, they do make no effort to change their minds. Another interesting thing I would like to tell you about here is actually mentioned in your Japanese or English bulletin. Sorry, there are three typos in the English version. I apologize for that. It says, be careful of your thoughts. And this is just your thoughts in your heart and your um, mind as well. So once again, um, be careful of your thoughts, for your thoughts become your words. You re realize that. And the next one, be careful of your words, for your words become your deeds. And be careful of your deeds, because your deeds become your habits. So you can realize that if you something you do repeatedly will become a habit. But for example, if you brush your teeth, that it's a habit, right? And it's because you just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, and then all of a sudden you just naturally do it because it's a habit. Next one. Be careful of your habits, for your habits become your character. Be careful of your character, for your character become your, will become your destiny. So where did this start from? It starts from your thoughts. When you hear God's word and you deny it, you are making the choice to actually determine your faith in a sense. It's impacting where your destiny is because you may not have the opportunity to hear it again. When people um, make decisions, then they, their life heads in that direction. They are actually determining where they're headed. That's why the Bible says numerous times today, you know, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today may be the last chance you have to believe in God. Your heart may be harder tomorrow. So even if you hear the same thing tomorrow, you may not be able to believe in it. So that's why today is the day of salvation. If you believe, if you refuse in God and you continually do so, regardless of what you hear, regardless of what you see, regardless of what you experience, you're still going to be um, refusing him. And that's what's going to happen without exception in the Great Tribulation as well. If you, you can imagine such a f uh, phenomenon, you, it's very tragic. I will say once again, today is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to have your grace of faith and to be able to be changed in the people who worship you. Thank you for choosing us and bestowing your love upon us. Unfortunately, Lord, we know that many of our family members and friends are not saved. Lord, we ask that you strengthen our faith and allow us to have the courage to share our faith and our testimony with others. We ask that you listen to our prayer. Amen. Let's pray for a moment in silence now. <laughs> 